Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We began chapter 10 last week with the subject of divorce, the subject of marriage, and we begin our passage in verse 13, which will carry us through verse 31, when some families who have not been broken by divorce, but are very concerned about their children come to the Lord with those children. We read in verse 13, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again, and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Way back in the 11th century, a British theologian named Anselm wrote a book titled, Why Did God Become Man? It's an important book, and that may be the most important question we can ask. Did Christ become a man to be a teacher, or an example, or a sacrifice? The orthodox answer is to be a sacrifice. He came into this world to die. But was that necessary? Could we be saved without his death? At the end of Galatians 2, Paul said it was absolutely necessary. He proves it very simply. If it were possible for us to save ourselves by our good deeds... If righteousness comes through the law, he wrote, 
then Christ died needlessly. God would never have sent his son to die needlessly. He never would have sent his son if we could save ourselves. He never would have sent his son to suffer the shame and pain of the cross if it were not necessary. The cross is the proof that Christ's death was necessary. And Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Left to ourselves, we would all perish eternally. That is demonstrated in two incidents Mark records in the 10th chapter of his gospel. First, from little children, and then from a grown man. From children with nothing, and a man with everything. Both show the complete inability of man to save himself. And the disciples got it. Because they asked the question, then who can be saved? Jesus answered, with people, it is impossible. Fortunately, that is only the first part of his answer. The second part is, but all things are possible with God. That is why God became man, to make the impossible possible. The first incident that proves the necessity of the cross is when some parents bring their children to Jesus so that he might bless them. Jesus has just discussed divorce with the Pharisees. In a moment, a young man seeking eternal life will leave Jesus disappointed because of his wealth. In between those two incidents the, are the parents with their children. And the, the significance and the beauty of this story of the children and parents is seen in its setting. On the one side of that incident is a household destroyed by divorce, by lust. On the other side of this incident is a human life ruined by greed. Lust and greed, that's the world. That's what serious parents have to guard their children against. And this is the best way to do that, the way these parents did that, by bringing their children to Christ. It was a Jewish custom to bring children to the elders for blessing. The practice went back as far as Genesis 48 when Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph. These parents were doing that until the disciples disrupted things. They began to rebuke them and send them away. They were, they were trying to protect the Lord's time. And children, they thought, were utterly unimportant. But they weren't unimportant to the Lord, and His time was not so precious that He couldn't spare it for them. He stopped the disciples. Mark says He was indignant. He was angry with them. And then He used the interruption to give an important lesson on eternal life. For, he said, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now those words, such as, are important. Jesus wasn't teaching the kingdom of God, of God is literally populated by children, as though that's a requirement for entrance. And no doubt there are multitudes of children that have entered into heaven, but his meaning is found in the comparison he makes, the such as these. Now, how we must be like children has been explained in different ways. The uh, innocence of children or the humility of a child has been suggested as the, the meaning in contrast to the pride of the Pharisees who had just been challenging Jesus. Luke, though, is very helpful here because in his account of this incident, he uses the word babies. It's, it's the word for infants. Infants. 
The parents had to carry them to Jesus. People enter the kingdom the way they enter the world, naked and helpless, for whom everything must be done because they can do nothing for themselves. Infants are totally dependent. They have nothing to show for themselves. They have no possessions, no achievements. They aren't productive. They have nothing to boast about. As someone said, their hands are empty like a beggar. All they can do is open them and receive what's given to them. They must be carried. They must be brought. So those who are like them are not people who work for God's righteousness, who labor for his acceptance, but people who receive his righteousness as a free gift by grace through faith. People like those in Top Lady's hymn, Rock of Ages, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. People who come like that, like children, like infants, who receive, who simply believe, they have the kingdom. That's what Jesus said. Then in an expression of genuine affection, Jesus received the children. He took them in his arms and blessed them. The disciples couldn't be bothered with the children, but children are not unimportant. They are not unimportant to the Lord. He defended them and he gave them his undivided attention. They're never too young to hear Bible verses. Remember many years ago, Dr. Johnson talking about when he was uh, a young father, had their first child, their first, their son, and he said he would often walk by the crib where his son was sleeping, and he would say, 1 John 4, 8, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He kept saying that to his, to his little baby boy. Well, they're never too young to hear Bible verses repeated, never too young to hear hymns of the faith and for parents and grandparents and for the church to be praying for them. That's how we bring our children to the Lord for blessing. And he responds to that. He responds to our efforts. He responds to the, the declaring of his, of his word to the children and to our prayers for them. Now, just as Jesus leaves the children, a second incident occurs when a man approaches him. The disciples were impressed with this man, and he was impressive. Matthew describes him as young. Luke tells us he was a ruler, probably a civil magistrate, and extremely rich. He's come down to us as the rich young ruler. He was the very opposite of the children Jesus had been holding and comparing to those who enter the kingdom. But he had much on his mind about the kingdom. And so as Jesus was preparing to leave, he came up to him. Mark says he ran up to him and knelt before him. He asked, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He was a man who had much, he had great possessions, but he, he knew that, that he was lacking something. And I think it brings out the point that we can have all the possessions in this world. We can have all the material things that, that we so desire and that so tempt us, and it's not going to give us fulfillment. And this young man who had it all knew that he lacked something. And what he lacked was the assurance of salvation, and he was anxious about that. And that in and of itself is a good thing. So he came. He came to the right person, and he asked this most important question. What must I do to be saved? There, there are no more important questions than why did God become man and what must I do to be saved? Unfortunately, he didn't ask that first question. And the reason may be indicated in the way he asked this second question. 
What shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Now, it's not necessarily wrong to ask that. It's a good question. We're, we're not blocks of wood. We do something. We have minds, we have wills, and, and we must become like a child. We must humble ourselves. We must believe. In John chapter 6 and verse 29, Jesus said, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. That you believe in Me, is what He's saying. That you believe in the Son of God. But this man wasn't thinking about receiving. This man was thinking about achieving. And his first problem was with that first question about God becoming man. When a person thinks he can achieve, thinks he can save himself, he won't think he needs a Savior or think it's necessary for God to become man. So he didn't know who it was he was speaking to. And that is where Jesus first challenged him in an attempt to make him think, to stir up his thought, to reconsider. He said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. One of the older commentators on the Gospels, Alfred Plummer, wrote that there is no instance in the whole Talmud of a rabbi being addressed as good master. The title was absolutely unknown among the Jews. So Jesus was warning him against using such a, a hallowed term without considering its meaning. And perhaps in doing that, cause him to think more deeply about who Jesus really is. He was saying to this young man, you call me good. Do you think I'm God? That's important because the gospel is not only believe. People believe all kinds of things. Everybody believes something. The gospel is believe in the God-man who died in your place. But this man was using the word good of Jesus as meaning better than most, or maybe the best. And so he had come to, in his mind, this moral man, this really good man, with a question that had been bothering him and spoke to him as one good man to another. But in connecting the word good to God, the Lord was also saying to him that if he wanted to talk about good and doing good in connection with eternal life, then it is good in the absolute sense. It is good in the sense that God is good, which means good in the sense of perfection. Absolute perfection. And when he understands that, should he understand that, really understand it, then he will understand how utterly impossible it is to do anything good to inherit eternal life. So to make that clear to him, in verse 19, the Lord lists some of the commandments which are a revelation of God's goodness. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Jesus quoted from the Ten Commandments, Numbers 5 to nine, but he added defraud not. That's not in the Ten Commandments. That's from Deuteronomy 24, verse 14. It requires prompt payment of wages to a hired servant. So it's about money. And the Lord may have added something more about money because he knew what was of most importance to this young man. And he wanted to stir his conscience but the man was unaffected. Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. He meant it. And I think we should understand this is a, a good young man. This is a moral young man, a fine young man, careful in his business and behavior. 
And Jesus responded him, to him with all of the warmth and, and affection that he had for those little children that had been brought to him. Mark wrote, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. He saw in him an earnest young man who had an interest in eternal things and wanted to do good, but didn't understand what good actually required. Nothing short of perfection. And so to help him understand and bring him to see his failure and need, the Lord gave him a challenge that went right to the heart of the problem. Of the five of the Ten Commandments that Jesus listed, he didn't mention the Tenth Commandment. You shall not covet. That's where he shows the man his failure by telling him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But he couldn't do that. At these words, he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Luke wrote, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. He loved his possessions, and he wanted to keep them more than he wanted to serve God. Which shows that he really didn't understand the commandments, and hadn't really kept them at all. The Ten Commandments, as you know, can be summarized in two great commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the man failed on both. He obviously didn't love his neighbor as himself. He kept everything from his neighbor, kept it for himself. And he didn't love God with all his heart. He wouldn't follow God's Son. In fact, he had broken the first two commandments by making an idol out of his money and loving it more than God. He worshipped mammon. So he hadn't kept the commandments. He'd broken them. He couldn't keep the one command to sell all any more than he could keep the ten, any more than he, than he could keep the 613 laws of the Old Testament. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. That's the purpose of the law. The, the, the law was not given as a way of salvation. It was not given as, as, as the path to God. It was given to show us we cannot save ourselves. We cannot keep those commandments. It was given us to us to show the, uh, the man's inability to obey and earn salvation. That's what the Lord was showing this, this eager young man with this challenge. He wasn't endorsing a salvation by works. As the Lord said in John 6, the work of God is to believe in His Son. Salvation has always been by grace through faith, not works. And Jesus was not advocating anything different from that. Nor was the Lord opposing wealth and promoting poverty or asceticism and the monastery. This passage influenced St. Francis of Assisi to leave his wealth and become a monk. Scripture doesn't teach that. That's absolutely, totally contrary to the Word of God. What Scripture teaches is hard work, thrift, the virtue of, of having a family and supporting it, not depending on others. You see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11. I love that verse. It's, it's a brief statement to the Thessalonians in which Paul basically says, here's the basic Christian life. You want to live a godly life? Well, it's not go to seminary and become a preacher or leave this country and go off on the foreign mission field. That's good, and that's a way of serving the Lord if the Lord has called a person to do that. But the basic Christian life is stated in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11, where he says, Make it your ambition. This ought to be your ambition to lead a quiet life. 
minding your own business, working with your hands. Be a good, responsible neighbor. That's what he's saying. He says something similar in Ephesians 4, verse 28, when Paul says, you who steal, stop stealing. Instead, performing good with your hands. In other words, work so that you can provide for the poor, for someone in need. And so, don't steal, don't take, give. And, and work so that you can do that. We are to be a giving people. We are to be a generous people. But to be generous and be able to give, you have to work, be wise with your money, provide for your family, and have something to give to those who are in need. That's the Christian life. It's a basic, simple life of being an orderly, productive person. So the Lord is not in this instance laying down a rule of life for the church. He was challenging this man in order to, to open his eyes so that he would see his failure and his need to repent. It was a unique test for a particular person. And I find a real example here, what evangelism is to be, how it's to be done. It's not some rote way or some cookie cutter formula for giving the gospel. The Lord had a skill in, in knowing exactly where this, a, a person's need was and addressing that. I, I can't claim the same kind of skill that he had. And of course, he is unusual in that regard. But he gives us, I think, the principle of how we're to give the gospel. And it's as we listen to people, as we talk to them, we learn about them, we are able to get a sense of, of what their problem really is and then address that. And that's what he did here. This was unique for this particular person. It's not a universal requirement that he's laying down here. But it does show something that is universal, and that is salvation involves quitting idols and turning to Christ. And if one genuinely turns to Christ, they do turn from idols. It's similar to what Joshua told Israel. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, the Lord or the gods of the Amorites. Everyone has to make that choice. And wealth and lust are the gods of this age. They're really no gods. They are actually addictions. And they will always disappoint. They promise much. They always disappoint. Paul told Timothy to point that out to the rich in the church. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and many foolish desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. The love of money is the root of all evil, he said. It is hard to give it up. Kent Hughes told of a conversation the missionary Amy Carmichael had with a Hindu queen who showed some spiritual interest and wanted to know what was necessary for salvation. What did she need to do? And so Miss Carmichael read the, the woman some of what Jesus said about himself and read her some Scripture, and as she was reading the Bible, the queen's face became sorrowful. So far must I follow so far? She said, I cannot follow so far. Well, neither could this young man. He couldn't put away the idol of wealth, and so he left, and Jesus looked around at his disciples and said, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And we know why. Wealth promises so much. Wealth promises security. It promises happiness now in this life. That's what it promises, but it's a lie. Solomon said, wealth has wings. And if it doesn't fly away from us, eventually we fly away from it. All of the money in the world cannot keep us out of the sickbed or out of the grave. That's a false God. 
That's a foolish God to have. But this statement by the Lord amazed His disciples. They believed wealth was a sign of blessing. And, and they believed that with reason. In the Old Testament, God promises prosperity to the obedient. And so it was a sign of God's blessing. You see that particularly in Deuteronomy 28. There, he, there Moses says, listen, if you will be obedient, you will prosper. You will, you will lead the nations. You will, you will always enjoy victory. You will be the head, not the tail. You will have harvest. You will have abundance. The point being, it pays to be obedient. And they couldn't do that. Well, that's what the disciples were taught. That's what the Scriptures indicated. And so... They see this man who had it all. He was young, he was wealthy, he was powerful, he was clean. He was a moral man, a spiritual man, and he's damned? That didn't make sense. So Jesus repeats how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God and then strengthens his point by giving a shocking, if not humorous, example of the impossible. Verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The Cambridge scholar C.F.D. Mole paraphrased it as, It is easier to thread a needle with a great big camel than to go into the kingdom of God when you are bursting with riches. Some have explained the eye of the needle as a small gate in Jerusalem through which uh, a camel could enter only by first kneeling and being unloaded of its burden. Uh, the idea is the rich must humble themselves. Uh, it's a nice picture, but it's, it's not supported by the language. I don't think it's even supported by archaeology, but it's certainly not supported by the language, and it misses the point that the Lord was making. He was using fantastic language. He's using... Uh, a, a, an absurd picture to illustrate forcefully the human impossibility of entering the kingdom of God. And the disciples got it because they were even more bewildered than before. Then who can be saved, they asked. If not the rich, what about the poor? What about the rest of us? And Jesus looking at them said, with people it is impossible. Not only rich people, but people generally, all people, universally, it is impossible. Then mercifully, the Lord adds, but with God, but he said, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. It's impossible for men to break the lure of riches and their attachment to this world. It's impossible for people to become like babies, see themselves as helpless, and look for mercy. We can't do it. That happens only by God's grace. By His grace, we can do it. Because by His grace, He causes it to occur. Because by His grace, He gives faith and repentance. Those were great words of encouragement. What we can't do, God can do, and God will do. But Peter was stuck on the word impossible, and still it seems stuck on that, that rich young ruler. He said in verse 28, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. They, they had done what the rich young ruler had not done. They had given up their fishing nets, their tax office, whatever they were doing, their businesses. They'd left it all and they'd followed him. But Jesus just said, with men, salvation is impossible. So had they left everything for nothing? That's the concern of his question. What then will there be for us? Will we have anything to show for our investment? Have we done a foolish thing in all of this? Jesus answers that no one who follows him will ever 
be cheated out of anything. Far from it. Whatever we may give up will be more than paid back to us. Verse 29. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. That's not a promise that we will be rich and healthy now. That's the promise in the last part of verse 30, in the age to come, eternal life. There we have it all. Then God will wipe away every tear from our eye. There will be no sin. There will be no more pain. We will enjoy life to the full far more than we can even comprehend now. We will enter into perfection and glory. That's eternal life. Now, however, we have trials, persecutions, he said. But still, and this is the assurance that the Lord is giving, in this life God will supply all our needs perfectly. It's what Paul says in Philippians 4.19, God will supply all your needs according to the riches of His glory. He will do it according to His wisdom. And in the church, He will give us a new family where we have friends that stick closer than a brother or sister like Proverbs 17.17. 17. I'm sure this had a particular uh, importance uh, direct applicability to the Jews of the first century because when they trusted Christ, when they looked to Him as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Savior, they were ostracized. They lost their family. They lost their friends. It's the story of John chapter 9 and the, the blind man who is given sight and when he trusts in Christ, he, he's excommunicated from the synagogue and his parents distance themselves from him. He's, suddenly, he has sight, but he has nothing else. He's on the outside until Jesus comes to him. And then he has a family. And then he has a friend. And so it would be with all of those in that first century who would leave the synagogue or be put out of the synagogue. Well, they'd be put out of that and they'd lose that community, but they'd have something far greater and as we walk by faith, God supplies us with everything we need for the moment and, and gives us the best for that moment. The, the rich young ruler wouldn't give up his possessions and trust the Lord. But the Lord had not asked him to give up his riches, only to put them in a stronger safe and a better investment to put them in the bank of heaven. What if he had done that? What if he had made himself, as verse 31 says, last among men in the world? He would have become first for all eternity, where his riches would have increased beyond measure. And he would have followed Christ. Now, there's no greater privilege in life. There's no greater privilege in this whole wide world than being called into the company of Jesus Christ to follow the eternal Son of God, God who became man. When one of the old guard who served with Napoleon in Russia was told of the general's death, he said, if I could see him again, I would follow him to the end of the world. If men have such loyalty to a flawed human being, should we not have such loyalty to Him who is God and became man to die for us? Well, the question answers itself. Of course we should. He's the captain of our salvation. And He is leading us through this world like a great general, leading us in conquest and leading us on to glory forever forever. 
What a life He has given to you, soldiers of the cross. What a life. Let goods and kindred go. May God give us that heart and that desire. There is wisdom. But to follow Him, to follow the Son of God, we must first come to Him. Come to Him as a child, an infant, as helpless with nothing on and nothing in our hands, nothing to boast about. Come as beggars seeking mercy alone. That's who God saves. That's who follows. That is who Christ gives first place for all eternity. If you've not believed, stop trusting in this world's riches. They fade. They don't support you in the greatest time of need. They're a false god. Stop trusting in them. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in anything but Him. Trust in Him. You have nothing to lose by doing that but your sin, your guilt, your hopelessness, and you have eternity to gain. May God help you to do that. And help all of us to follow Christ. Father, it's a blessed truth that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can't even separate ourselves from it. That's how great and how strong your love for us is. That's how effective his sacrifice was for wretched sinners. We give you praise and thanks for that. What is impossible for us is easy for you. And you've done it at a great cost. We give you praise and thanks for that. All glory goes to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.